Mm. All right. Remember, stay hydrated, kids. Stay healthy. If you haven't washed your hands in the last like 90 minutes, go ahead and do that now while we're setting up. OK, so this is going to be the second meeting of our Corona class. All right. So good to see some of y'all back. And uh, we've got Tyler over here and we've got uh, Sam and Robert. Um, hey there, everybody. Brandy, hello. And great to see y'all. Now, today's session is going to be focusing on the so-called, uh, what a lot of y'all refer to, especially if you use the McKay textbook, as the age of anxiety, which is actually a long poem that was published after World War II. But this is a something that we tend to look at in terms of 20th century or, you know, truly like modern art and philosophy. So we're going to focus on art and philosophy post-World War I, okay? And we can go into post-World War II, but basically remember that the questions that are going to get priority are going to be on 20th century modern art and philosophy, okay? So we're thinking about uh, expressionism, existentialism, uh, Dada, we can talk about Dada a little bit, which is, uh, which is always so fun, right? Okay, so as far as that goes, that's going to be the focus. Every once in a while, I'll get, uh, I'll open my phone and we will do some Instagram and Twitter shout outs for people who are recent followers. Um, so keep that in mind. Those are going to be uh, going to be done. Uh, you know, occasionally we'll say hello, but we want to uh, have a teaching and learning session here. All right. So, oh my goodness, that is, uh, that's really funny. Remember yesterday, like my Instagram started off with uh, General Kenobi, uh, which is what we started off with yesterday. So uh, yeah, when's the next episode of Clone Wars coming out? That'll be in a couple days. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and get started. Um, get into the material and Miss uh, Chippentine is here. All right. And is Ross here? We will find out about that, Abby. All right, so let's go ahead and think in terms uh, of this. Now, we've got a question from Pranitha. What significant role did women play during and after World War I? Okay, so one thing that we want to note is that there were many women who, during World War I, worked in the armaments industry. Those of you who have already... <clears throat> Had, you had a push, you learned about Rosie the Riveter in World War II. Well, when we look at World War I, uh, we see that from a lot of European countries, now even Canada as well, okay? So uh, Brian saying, bruh. All right, so, you know, women are working in these armaments factories, and, uh, you know, so that's something that you want to note. Now, also, the women's suffrage movement had been going on for quite a while. Um, Emmeline Pankhurst uh, is somebody, now, of course, you should be taking notes. You should have a pen and paper writing things down. This isn't Harry Potter, okay? So, with that, uh, you know, you want to be thinking about Emmeline Pankhurst, P-A-N-K-H-U-R-S-T, that she was a British suffragette and she was campaigning for women's suffrage. So that had been going on for quite some time. When you go to her Wikipedia page, there's actually a really great photo of her uh, you know, resisting arrest uh, you know, because she's being arrested for her advocacy of women's suffrage. Now, let me go ahead and pull that up. so that y'all can see it. We might as well all look at it together, right? So let's just go ahead because this, if you're looking at a uh, women's rights, women's suffrage in the 20th century uh, topic on the exam, she's always a great piece of outside evidence, okay? So Emmeline Pankhurst, an English political activist, uh, there she is there. She seems, uh, you know, very, uh, you know, looks kind of docile there, but not a very docile woman at uh, at all. Uh, let's see, where is that, uh, where is that thing there? Let's see, I'm looking for something here. Uh, now, okay, there she is uh, wearing prison clothes. Okay, so that's the thing. You've got to understand that uh, you know, suffragettes were often put into prison. Uh, she said it was like incarceration was like a human being in the process of being turned into a wild beast. Now, note that some of these women who were imprisoned went on hunger strikes uh, to protest their imprisonment, and several of them were force-fed uh, during this time um, so that they were basically made to eat. 
thank you, Hannah Chow and Cher420 for the recent uh, for the recent follows. Uh, very thankful for y'all's support. All right. So with that, I'm going into um, seeing if we can find that picture that I was looking for. Now there is Emmeline Pankhurst. Um, she is, and actually this may be her speaking in the United States. She actually gave a very moving speech in the United States called Freedom or Death. Now, of course, that's kind of uh, playing on uh, what Patrick Henry said. Okay, so when we think about Patrick Henry um, at that uh, during the American Revolution saying, give me liberty or give me death. And so you can see the really uh, the really radical tone of Pankhurst, uh, you know, of, of her uh, speeches and her writings and her advocacy that essentially that getting the right to vote isn't just some kind of luxury that she would like to have. She's saying that I would like to uh, be able to participate in the political process the same way that a man can, or I'd rather die. And so, you know, it's a very moving speech there. Now, you can see here that these are women being force fed uh, who were um, involved in these hunger strikes. And so very, very much. OK, there's the picture that I was thinking about here. You see that she is being uh, forcibly arrested. She's only trying to present a petition to the king in 1914. Now, this is right before World War I. So note here that this movement has been going on for quite a while. And World War I, now some countries did have women's suffrage uh, before World War I, okay? So that's something to note that not necessarily uh, everyone here is not necessarily, you know, every country is doing this after World War I. Britain was actually one of the later countries, I believe. So just to look at timeline of women's suffrage. OK, so that's important to note that causal relationship between World War One and women's suffrage. OK, so when we look at now, here's something for women's suffrage in the United States, but I'm looking for something a little bit more global. OK, so we see here now they've got one. Let's see if we go to the article. Uh, if we go here, we might be able to get a global, let's see, the right of women. OK, now this is only focusing on the United States. Um, let's go ahead and say by country and see what comes up there. All right. Now, just timeline of women's suffrage. OK, so when we look here, uh, we can see that in uh, in some places you can see in 1862, um, Sweden and Argentina are allowing women to vote in. Um, you know, in local elections, the state of Wyoming was the first uh, state to allow women full suffrage. OK, so we see here full suffrage for women. So this is going back here and then we can see that several U.S. states, especially in the West, in the late 19th century. And as we go into, uh, you know, into uh, the world, we see in 1902, Australia is allowing women to vote in federal elections on the same terms as men. So we see Finland, we see Denmark limited to local. But then again, you know, you start to see here that once World War I happens, you see that you've got definitely a very, uh, you know, we see a lot of people jumping on the bandwagon here. OK, so by 1918, 1919, uh, then we're going to see more of this uh, happening. So do understand that, but understand that this women's suffrage movement was going on for some time before World War I. And again, Emmeline Pankhurst, somebody who is very good to know here. Uh, now, um, when we say things like Wikipedia isn't a trustable source, uh, now Wikipedia is not something that I would cite on an essay that I were turning in for academic purposes, uh, but it is generally, as far as a reference, uh, it is generally a reliable source, okay? So when we're looking for something like a timeline of women's suffrage, so just understand that the use of Wikipedia as a general reference is something that's a lot different from the use of Wikipedia um, in terms of a, you know, in terms of using it 
um, it's for an academic essay, okay? So with that, just, uh, yeah, keep that in mind. Now, also remember the chat has not turned into a mess yet today, but people have said that if the chat turns into a mess, just view the view the broadcast full screen and you won't even have the you won't even have to look at the chat okay so as far as that uh, goes why is it called the age of anxiety okay so so here's the thing that when we think about world war one okay that world war one represents um you know in a lot of ways the end of the age of enlightenment okay so if we think about like what is the age of enlightenment you know kant asked are we living in an enlightened age no but we are living in an age of enlightenment now the thing is as time went on people started to think in these terms that we are living in an age of enlightenment let me go ahead and make a google document which i'll share with y'all um, but you know some of y'all like a lot of, a lot of times too many people show up you may not be able to go in the google document with me but i am going to screen share okay so i'm going to note here let's see eu vid dash o2 um session notes okay so let's think about this uh, you know, when we think about World War I as a turning point, uh, you know, in terms of European art and philosophy. Okay, so let's think about, uh, let's think about this. All right, so an internet error occurred. What in the devil? Okay, so I think we're fine now. And I'm going to go ahead and share a link. Now, remember, it may not allow y'all to uh, everybody to go here where you're, you will not have editing privileges in the Google Doc. OK, you will not have editing privilege here, uh, privileges here. That's right, Hannah. What in the devil? All right. So as far as that goes, thank you, Hank. Uh, Shivam. All right, Shivam, you followed me here. And Aiden and Natalie, thank y'all so much for the Instagram follows here. All right. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, let's go to the Google document and let's think about, you know, World War One. So, uh, you know, we, we first talked about women's suffrage um, and we want to note Emmeline Pankhurst, okay? Uh, you want to make sure that you know who she is. Uh, she would be the best illustrative example. So, you know, we think about what is the so-called age of anxiety. Uh, you know, this is something that if we think about this, we want to think about World War I as a turning point, okay? So World War I as a turning point in the way that people thought, okay? And so what I wanna think about here is what does it mean to be anxious? Which of course we know now, let's think about this. Um, you know, we, we think right now it doesn't feel like we're living in an age of enlightenment, does it? Does it? So the age of enlightenment versus the age of anxiety, okay? Now, when we think about the values of enlightenment, we wanna think about, and y'all can go ahead and put some things in the chat, what you're thinking about there but when i think about the age of enlightenment we think that uh you know that science and technology so science technology and rational thinking okay so rational you know rational rationality and empiricism will make you know will lead will make the you know will lead to human progress will lead to ongoing human progress okay um that basically things will keep getting better keep getting better and better and better as we continue to develop along these lines okay so when we think about the age of enlightenment it is a very like optimistic um, kind of thinking because it's like if we keep going along this path, uh, you know, so this is basically, a, you know, it is optimistic, okay? And we think in terms of, you know, human perfectibility, okay? So, you know, this is something that when we think about the Enlightenment, 
let's see. So human perfectibility. When we think about human perfectibility, it's this idea that we are going toward, it's, it's not necessary. Well, in some ways, you know, it is, it's, it's kind of a paradox of the enlightenment. If you think about it, that it is in some ways, almost a utopian kind of way of thinking about this, that science, technology, rationality, empiricism, uh, they will, uh, you know, they will lead us to this promised land, really. And so human perfectibility is this idea that we're on this ongoing trajectory. Now, when we think about the age of anxiety, you know, this is something where it is, you know, uncertain. OK, so it's uncertain. And, you know, when when we think about this, that who are we? OK, who are we? Uh, you know, when we think about, for example, that, you know, truth, when we think about the enlightenment, um, we can know truth. OK, we can know truth. We can understand people and the world that we live, you know, the world in which we live. OK, uh, you know, I think maybe not just the world, but the universe. OK, so the universe in which we live. And so when we look here that we no longer have any idea who we are, okay? We no longer have any idea who we are. You know, truth, it does truth even, does objective truth even exist, okay? And that's what we're thinking about like after World War I because you think about the, you know, World War I is being kind of the period at the end of a very long sentence called the Enlightenment. Because when we think about the Industrial Revolutions, like these are children of the Enlightenment philosophy that we will continue to develop technologically and things are going to get better. So when you look at the late 19th century, you start to see like sanitation, public health, uh, that we learn things about diseases, how to keep people from dying. Now, World War I, all of a sudden we use all of these scientific and technological developments to kill each other, okay? And so, so this is, you know, is something that is, you know, definitely, uh, you know, changing, but World War I is having a big hand in this. So when we think about this, that, you know, there is, there is a belief that humanity is not necessarily progressing. There is doubt, okay, about whether humanity is progressing, uh, you know, is progressing and there is no certainty, okay? There is a lack of certainty. Uh, you know, about the future, uh, the future and where things are going. And this is where you can kind of think about that in the 19th century, okay? So when we think about the Enlightenment, we think about the 18th and 19th centuries. Now, I'm thinking like a long Enlightenment, okay? This is the way I'm explaining this is we're, we're making a long Enlightenment uh, rather than a short Enlightenment, right? So the age of anxiety, we may think about the 20th century, okay? And what we see is in the, you know, we see the development of liberal democracy, OK, uh, that the idea that as we continue to pursue liberal democracy, we are going to be able to uh, to have all of the thing, all of the progress that we wanted. And so what you see here in the 20th century is the rise of dictatorships. Uh, you know, that there is in a lot of places, there's a lot of doubt about democracy. Now, let's think about the Great Depression, for example. We want to think that about that as well, uh, that we have, uh, you know, that we have economics figured out. OK, so we see that uh, there is economic growth. OK, uh, and then we think about something like the Great Depression. OK, this is, you know, when we're thinking about the second industrial revolution record economic growth, you know, versus the Great Depression. This is something that is also making people quite anxious. And during the Great Depression, what we want to think about is that it's actually like the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany uh, and uh, fascist Italy, they seem to be handling the Depression 
better than other countries. So there's even doubt for those of you who've had U.S. history when you look at the New Deal, for example, uh, that, you know, the government in the United States uh, takes on a larger role than it has ever taken before. And so you see where that is, uh, you know, is something where people are starting to doubt uh, the, you know, the power of the market and laissez-faire. Um, this idea that, uh, you know, so basically laissez-faire, laissez-faire is working, okay, uh, you know, is working, whereas when we see here, laissez-faire is not working okay so that's something that you know we see here that after world war one it's very very important here so one thing we want to think about is when we think about art movements okay and how this anxiety is building up and producing new movements in art and philosophy um the first thing we want to note uh, you know which which just keep in mind as we're talking about the age of anxiety are we not living in an age of anxiety right now uh you know and especially when you think about not just with the coronavirus but like phone addiction and stuff like that you know we've got this new technology that we think is so great but then it's like wait there are consequences um, to this uh to this new technology so let's go ahead and take a look uh let's see uh going into here 773 joey and uh, abby and calvin the goat uh, thank y'all so much uh, for the follows now first of all let's look at dada okay dada or dadaism now what is dada okay when we think about like what is dada um the quite the thing is that we need to be careful about that question because that sounds like a question for the age of enlightenment. What is Dada? Is if we can answer that, okay? The age of anxiety, what is Dada? We don't necessarily know what, Dada is not supposed to be defined, okay? This is basically a form of nonsense art, okay? That this is not supposed to make sense. And so when we look at Dada, what we see here, now the most uh, famous, uh, now this is something that we see here, there is a Dada work, um, and it's just like, what is this, okay? This is just a bunch of random stuff here, and somebody like, look, I made an art, and that's what Dada is, okay? So as we keep on going through this, um, we're going to see more and more stuff like this that just looks like, complete nonsense. Now, the best thing for you to um, for you to note here is this one here, okay? That this is like, look, mom, I made an art, okay? And this art is called Fountain, okay? It's called Fountain. And what it is, although the artist calls it Fountain, it is a urinal that is turned on its side and then autographed. And then, hey, look, Fountain get it ha 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 actually you don't get it you know why because there's nothing to get and let's uh let's hydrate for a second there and y'all make sure you're keeping a social distance here as we learn together so it's not supposed to make sense i mean it's not exactly like when we think about jacques louis david's the oath of the horatii so when we think about Jacques Louis David's The Oath of the Horatii, then I can go into this and I can say, I can talk about how this is a piece of neoclassical art, uh, that this is the backdrop is the French Revolution. And we also see, we see classical republicanism here as these three brothers, uh, they volunteer their lives um, to battle for the state. It's basically like a three-on-three you know, a three on three David and Goliath sort of thing here. And then we look here at the influence of Rousseau and his view of women uh, being, uh, you know, relegated to the domestic sphere, that they are not cut out for this, that they are supposed to, like that a woman is supposed to raise and nurture children. You see where this woman is with her sons. We see that these women are sad. These are the wives of the three men, okay? That these men are going and they're volunteering themselves, that they're being patriotic 
and they're acting like men in the public sphere and these women are acting like women in the oh I, you know i haven't this is a new kind of feature here that now when i zoom in i can zoom in on particular places i've never really seen that before this is cool all right so i can explain this and that is what the enlightenment is about this is neoclassical enlightenment art whereas with this if i try to explain what's going on here and what it means it is meaningless okay uh that that it is a, a, a nonsense, you know, nonsense art that rejects, okay, the, you know, rationale, you know, any form of rational explanation, okay, um, or explain, you know, at rational explanation of its meaning, okay, that it's rejecting that. Now, also, we want to note that when we look at some of these art movements, they are also very, uh, you know, very much motivated. They're associated in a lot of ways with left-wing politics, okay? So, you know, typically associated with left-wing politics now when you see also when we think about like totalitarian dictators um, they tended to reject modern art okay like th this sort of modern art okay so you know things like dada and expressionism like hitler had one thing we want to note here is that when we look at the art of you know totalitarianism uh you know we can look at um uh, for example uh Okay, so futurists like close of the line. Okay, so when we look at futurism, okay, um, so that's something that when we look at, okay, so Mussolini. Now, futurism, we see the art here, okay, and so you know, Mussolini chose to give patronage to numerous styles and movements, okay, so we see here that, uh, you know, this is a piece of futurist art okay which looks kind of cool like when you think about it but it's seeing some type of future now it's also modern uh, but it's modern in a different way than dada okay so when we think and i'm going to go talk about some other mark movements but um okay so dictatorships and art okay um uh, and and what we're going to note here yeah left-wing politics in uh, you know, in democratic countries as well. Um, so when we look at dictatorships in art, we would look at Mussolini and we think about futurism, okay? So he was, uh, you know, he patronized futurist artists, okay? Um, and so Mussolini patronized futurist artists. Now, when we look at, uh, when we look at Stalin, okay? So when we think about, uh, when we think about Stalin, in the soviet union um then we're going to look at socialist realism okay so when you when you look at these dictators uh you know so hitler uh you know so hitler in nazi germany would put on degenerate art ex exhibitions okay so the not so basically the nazis would hold degenerate art exhibitions uh, to uh you know to basically to bolster a negative opinion uh you know in, in order to bolster a negative opinion of modern art movements such as dada and expressionism okay uh, i'm going to get into expressionism in just a second okay but if we were going to look at socialist realism okay so if we're going to look for socialist realism um and this is in uh you know in the ussr especially so socialist realism in the soviet union okay so we're going to see now you see socialist classical um, Stalinist architecture, uh, you know, is employing classical styles as well. Okay, so you see that uh, this is, you know, now you can tell it's not like like it's a it's an infusion of classical and modern. Okay, so when we look at something like that in Stalinist architecture, it definitely incorporates some elements of the classical style. Uh, now, when we look at socialist realism here. 
um, there is Stalin, okay? There is a portrait of Stalin portrayed, uh, you know, really in something of an idealized form. But really, when you look at this, like, notice, like, you know, there's a bit of, like, gray on his temples and in his beard. Uh, you know, it's, it's portraying him as he would actually, uh, you know, appear. So that's one thing when you're looking at socialist realism. Uh, now this, uh, you know, let's see. So that, when we look at socialist realism, um, I think we, we might only be seeing, okay, so let's see, there is, uh, and this is something that's actually in, I kind of feel sorry in a way sometimes for Germans because, you know, you see here where there's a Soviet monument where basically this, uh, now, of course, you know, the, even though they call it realism, you've got this here, but this monument is still standing in Germany today. I would have maybe sent it back to uh, the Soviet Union, but you notice that it is cutting a swastika in half. Okay, so it's showing the Soviets. Now, the reason I'm saying, I, you know, it's like, you know, it's it's great. You see that the triumph over Nazism, but you see here where it's basically, you know, portraying the Soviet soldiers who came in and raped and looted and committed all kinds of atrocities. It's showing these communists uh, as liberators of Germany, but that is uh, that is still there in Berlin today. But that is in that style of socialist realism. So there is some glorification there, but it's definitely now when you look at this one, okay. Uh, now note here, this one says here, kind of like what we've been seeing is there's certainly some idealism here with this big old broadsword as if the soldiers are coming in with broadswords. Um, but then when we look at Lenin here, okay, Lenin sitting here, uh, you know, now this is it says it's living up to the title of realism more than most works of the style, okay? So when you look here, there is Lenin sitting there. Lenin looks a little bit like depressed or thoughtful and in a room with like, you know, there's no symmetry here. Uh, there are furniture covers, you know, when you think about furniture covers, um, that's something, you know, you see that, uh, you know, that Lenin is not in any way idealized in this uh, in this painting. So that's something just to kind of uh, to kind of keep in mind that in the, that there are several art movements that we see happening at this time. OK. And then so when we look at, uh, you know, for example, uh, Hitler, you know, Hitler's degenerate art exhibitions. OK, so that's something when you look at the degenerate art exhibition on um, this was in 1937 that they are the Nazis are showing off this art, but they're showing off this art as stuff that's what not to do. OK, so we see here that this is a uh, you know, we see here displayed, okay? So the Nazis were showing that this is degenerate art. This is not art that actually depicts like real things or real people. Um, so, you know, in a lot of ways, you can, you can definitely see how, you know, there were some of these totalitarian dictatorships, uh, you know, they were reactions against this modern art. Now, here's something suprematism okay this is something that's uh, that's very fascinating here we look at suprematism now suprematism this is something that was completely abstract okay so and this is art you know art you know completely abstract art okay completely abstract art that was meant to be separated entirely from physical reality, okay? So when we think about abstract art, it is art that does not depict anything that actually exists, okay? So what you can see here is a suprematist, uh, this guy Malevich, um, he has this, this is called Black Square. OK, and it's just all it is, is a black square on canvas. And it's like, look, mom, I made an art. And then as we go through here, it's like, you know what? I mean, he got so much acclaim over this in some circles. You're a genius. And so, you know what? Black circle. All right. So, I mean, you imagine like, I mean, is it losing its effect as it goes on as we go from black square to 
black circle, all right? And so now, whoa, white on white, and we've got the square, and it's white, and then it's like, whoa, like now it's actually crooked a little bit. What a freaking genius this guy is. Um, so, you know, suprematism. Now we see here, this is the title of his composition here. And he wanted this to be completely separated from any kind of reality. Okay, now his self-portrait there, which is, uh, you know, it's interesting, kind of like a Beetlejuice head there. Um, but that is an example of suprematism, which is a form of, uh, of modern art as well. And then we look at uh, expressionism. Okay, so I really enjoy looking at expressionism and expressionist art. Oh, we need to also look at surrealism, don't we? And let me just run into the chat real quick, see what we've got here, say hey to a few people here. And um, Dadaism, okay, so Sophia, Dadaism is not following an art movement, it is an art movement. So when we look at these art movements as a whole, they're moving away from like, from things that can be explained rationally. OK, so so that's what we want to note here as I go into our Google document. You know, I'll note that these are, you know, when we think about these that post, you know, so so we see that world the world war during the World War One era. OK, the World War One era, uh, you know, we saw, you know, we see the beginning of, you know, many, many forms of art that reject rejected the depiction of, you know, of uh, the literal depiction, okay? So basically the literal and rational depiction of the world, okay, of, of the world. Uh, so as far as that goes, the literal and rational depiction of the world is being rejected here. Um, so we see here that, uh, you know, then we go into expressionism. Uh, and this is something that's kind of a counterweight. We want to think of this as a counterweight to impressionism. Uh, that when we think about expressionism, this, uh, you know, this is meant, you know, art that is meant to depict you know, basically this art is meant to depict um, the inner emotional experience, okay? The inner emotional experience projected outward into the world, okay? So now this is, we can think of this as a counterweight to impressionism, okay? Because impressionism is about taking whatever I've, whatever I've got uh, you know, whatever I'm seeing and kind of giving, converting it into my impression. Like basically when Monet's painting water lilies, it's like I'm looking at, you know, I'm looking at these water lilies and this is the impression that I'm getting. OK, so so basically the inner emotional experience. OK, um, so projected outward, OK, projected outward and imposed into the world okay and a you know somebody who we could remember here is the work of otto dix okay who was a german world war one veteran okay so you know a german world war one veteran and we can also uh you know we can also see here um as we go into here the scream okay so when you look at the screen now this is now what we want to note here is that these art movements and philosophical movements they started before okay so they started before world war one but they gained popularity after world war one as people were more disillusioned about things in the known world so when you look at the screen okay you see that this you know just his face is misshapen okay so there's no burden on an expressionist artist to depict things as they look it, you're depicting things as they feel you're going into the grotesque and you look at this here and those are very like anxiety uh, ridden colors and just this idea that my inner experience like that I experience 
horror and it connects with this anxious feeling that people have during and after World War One. So going from there, uh, we could see some other things. Now, um, El Greco. Now, what's interesting when you look at El Greco, who was a Mannerist artist, a lot of El Greco's paint, El Greco's painting was very much influential for these 20th century artists uh, that are into this uh, expressionism. And so I haven't seen any, um, Oh, we see expressionist dance, okay, which we don't really see artworks, but that you've probably seen people engage in expressionist dance, where it's basically instead of following a type of rhythm. So if we think about dancing, like if you're learning tango or something like that, you go and you tango and you are um, when you tango, you're learning how to do a specific dance. Expressionist dance is basically I'm going to dance in, in accordance with my inner experience and people can interpret that based on the dance. So that is, uh, you know, a form of art that still, you know, people still practice this today, that I am expressing my inner life through dance okay so with that uh, i don't see any of otto dix's works let's see uh okay so otto dix uh if we look at his work i find that his work is especially um fascinating okay so we can see here um you know i think there might be some conflict over whether some of this stuff's in the public domain why you don't see more of it but this is stormtroopers advancing under gas okay so he painted a lot of a lot of world war one stuff which is not how it would appear to the eye uh, but how it would appear to the emotions, okay, to your inner eye, so to speak here. All right, and thank you, uh, Lexi, for the recent uh, like on Instagram. Much, uh, much appreciated. Uh, there is a shout out to DCHS. And so this is his inner experience. Now, then we look here where here is a portrait, and we see this portrait is, uh, you know, it's just, it's not how she really, appeared okay but it is like i mean look at those long fingers okay when we look at those long fingers and this is a fair use thing so it's not going to let me zoom in but those really long fingers almost like tentacles and so there is this idea of this expression here and also if you look up uh you know auto dicks war cripples okay so you know what you see here with the war cripples um of auto dicks is you know you see basically when he's looking at veterans okay so when he's looking at veterans um then you're seeing here that uh you know it's it's really like you know, this is where he's seeing like somebody who's, you know, these wounded veterans, you see him walking around on these peg legs. And this isn't how they literally look, but this is the impression he's getting. Here's a guy with a, you know, with an artificial jaw. Uh, you know, World War One. what we want to notice that World War One is like the first war where it is possible to, you know, to, keep people alive that have experienced like during the american civil war the crimean war these people would have died you know you see this guy it's like uh you know anakin skywalker uh you know artificial hand kind of thing here so you know you're seeing basically how does this affect the artist inner experience okay how is the inner experience shown here and what he sees when he looks at that stuff so when we look at this, we see here that Dada, suprematism, expressionism, there are several more art movements you could look into, but, you know, you definitely want to, uh, you know, know at least one of those and have a few, uh, you know, a few things that you might look into. So, you know, and also I would spend some time today, if I were you, I would use this as a platform to explore some of this art, especially like those of you who are fascinated by art, then, you know, go in and look around. I'm giving you really a platform for discussion. All right. And then, then we also want to think about um, as we see a lot of philosophers that were not necessarily like 
they were being read during the late 19th century and before World War I, but philosophy starts to really take a turn, okay? So one of the things I want to focus on would be existentialism, okay? So we're going to see here, you know, we think existentialism, which was this began in the late 19th century um, and gained, you know, gained a wider following after World War One. OK, so when we think about existentialism, for example, um, then we get into, first of all, you've got, uh, you know, Soren Kierkegaard, uh, which Soren Kierkegaard, somebody who may come up in some of your textbooks, um, but essentially that it rejects rationality. OK, so it re it rejects rationality uh you know rationality as a guiding principle of philosophy and focuses on uh focuses on two things okay so focuses on either uh you know what we what we would call not objective but subjectivity okay subjectivity and the absurd okay so when when the thing is when you look at existentialism that it is a rejection of the idea that philo that the uh, that the goal of philosophy is to pursue an objective truth okay and that's the thing that when we look at philosophy up to the point like you even think about marxism for example when we think about marxism marx is outlining a very specific program okay that this is what has happened throughout history and this is where things are going and a revolution a communist revolution needs these kind of conditions in order to happen and it will happen through the working class rising up you know that's why marx called this philosophy scientific socialism okay so scientific socialism that it is a science okay and when we start to see um this existentialist philosophy it is a rejection of that idea that there that anything is set okay so when we think about uh Kierkegaard, okay? Now, Kierkegaard was really, is really kind of the father of existentialism. And this is basically, this was, uh, you know, and we look at Kierkegaard is writing in the late 19th century. So, you know, Kierkegaard would be someone that, you know, we see that now he's actually like in the early uh, 19th century, and he's kind of seen to be the first existentialist philosopher, okay? So he basically gives us Christian existentialism, okay? Uh, that basically what he says here is he revives the idea of faith, okay? So he believed that faith was the highest ideal. Now, if we think about in terms of the enlightenment this is a you know what he's doing here this is a rebellion against both rationalism and materialism now what i mean by materialism is that like materials materialist philosophy uh, these are philosophies that reject any form of spirituality okay so, you know, what you think about Marxism is a materialist philosophy um, that Marx is very, very much, you know, very much grounded in these ideas of rationalism and materialism. OK, and so also he glorifies. So he felt like faith is what we're trying to do. And what he does here, he wrote a book called, which I've been uh, reading off and on. It's very deep. I can only read a few pages at a time. Uh, Fear and Trembling, okay? Uh, this is his his most famous book um, that he, you know, he uses, he, he props up Abraham, okay? So he uses Abraham, Abraham's sacrifice, of Isaac. Okay. So, you know, Abraham, the story of, you know, Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac, uh, you know, his not, you know, his not quite sacrifice of Isaac, but at the same time, we call this the sacrifice of Isaac uh, to, uh, you know, to prop up Abraham 
as the pen, you know, as a role model, like basically as the pinnacle, you know, basically the pinnacle, the epitome, I'll say, of faith. Okay. And basically, what should we be pursuing? We should not be pursuing necessarily truth. We should be pursuing faith. And he's got this idea of the night of faith, which this is very interesting. Some of this stuff is actually coming back into vogue. When you think about people's philosophies, you might've thought about like, you know, where people are talking about today about energy. And so it's getting, <laughs> all right. So, uh, you know, as far as that goes, remember, the World Health Organization says that you should dab, OK, that you should dab whenever you cough or sneeze. OK, and so we are getting um, in terms of it is getting to be like the season where people are going to, uh, you know, ask people to prom. So when we think about that, yeah, I can't give you Corona here. OK, um, so as far as that goes, that when we think about Kierkegaard, Kierkegaard says that basically if you have faith in something if you have the strongest faith then it's going to happen so we're getting to the point where a lot of you are in the season where you'll ask a girl to prom now a lot of times you're thinking i don't know if i want to ask her because she might go with me okay and you know she might not go with me but kierkegaard says if you truly believe that you will get this woman so he uses like the idea of like the peasant and the princess like the peasant if he decides that i'm going to get the princess and he has this full faith that he's going to get the princess that he will get her okay so you think about this if you're going to ask a girl to prom then make sure that uh you know you have confidence uh that you are going to uh that you're going to do that um, so as far as that goes, what am I even talking about? I'm just saying, like, when you can apply this stuff to life, um, it's the best thing that you can do here, not just applying it to an exam, but taking some of these philosophies and applying them to life. Like, if you ask a girl to prom and you, you don't have confidence in yourself, it's probably not going to happen. Okay. So as far as that, uh, yes, exactly. And that's Kierkegaard. Now, it doesn't make any rational sense, but Kierkegaard is saying that the highest thing that we should pursue is faith. Now, then there is Nietzsche. OK, so Frederick Nietzsche, um, you know, who was, uh, you know, who was also a philosopher in the 19th century. So Kierkegaard was a 19th century philosopher. OK, and so was Nietzsche. Z uh, okay um z s c h e okay n i e t z s c h e and so nietzsche also 19th century um and so nietzsche is the one who's basically kind of like a uh you know which kind of a the father of you know nihilism okay when we think about uh you know when we think about nihilism uh that nihilism is the rejection of any kind of of objective truth okay so rejection of any kind of objective truth uh you know so you think about this um that nietzsche is all often considered to be kind of a father of whoop, oops okay so you know when we think about nihilism we are going to see some kind of uh you know so we see here yeah. So Nietzsche is going to be somebody that we see in terms of, uh, you know, this diagnosis of nihilism, that we are not believing in things anymore. And so we think about this, that Nietzsche, you know, he was the one who said God is dead. OK, we have killed him. OK, so basically God is dead. We have killed him. That's what what he said here. Now, also, he published um, some books, uh, you know, one of the most famous being the Antichrist. OK, uh, you know, and in the Antichrist, basically Nietzsche says that, you know, he he is uh, he is he is advocating for a rejection of christian morality okay so basically a rejection of christian morality and values um and so he says that basically when we think about this that you know he says that christianity 
that it values weakness. Like when you think about this, like if you're going to be a good Christian, you're going to be kind, you're going to be charitable, you're going to have compassion for the weak. And Nietzsche's like, you know what? What what is this compassion for the weak thing? Why are we not glorifying strength? Okay. Nietzsche says that what we need to glorify is strength. We need to glorify the ubermensch or the superman. Um, this idea, so the idea of the ubermensch, okay? So the ubermensch or what we might call the superman, you know? So in the glorification of strength, and power. Okay, now you could see how here in the in the wrong hands, like this is definitely something. Now people can say that this is a misreading of Nietzsche, but certainly like Hitler's sister was a big devotee of Nietzsche, and Hitler incorporated um, some of this into his philosophy. I'm so glad to see that uh, that Brennan is uh, enjoying the uh, stream today. Thank you for your uh, kind comment on Instagram. And thank you, Hayden, for the recent follow and Bridget Banks. And so with that, um, you know, we see that Nietzsche also, when we think about, you know, beyond good and evil, okay? Um, so Beyond Good and Evil is another book. And this illustrates, you know, Nietzsche's, Nietzsche's rejection, okay, of any kind of set concept, okay, of any set concept of good and evil. So when you think about this, like the quote says, Nietzsche says, that which is done out of love takes place beyond good and evil. And you think about this, people do some crazy stuff for love. People have done some evil things for love. But what Nietzsche is saying is that, you know, now it's the first episode, but uh, so I'm not giving too much away. It's been years, it's been like almost a decade. Um, but in the first episode of Game of Thrones, when, uh, you know, one of the characters pushes another character out of the window because he saw something he shouldn't have seen. Now, Nietzsche would say, somebody might say, oh my goodness, that was evil. Well, Nietzsche would say, that was done out of love. And actually the character says at the end of that episode, the things I do for love. And you actually find out later, well, you know, we'll see. I, I won't spoil anything else for you. But the idea here is that, you know, in the first episode, you know, Jamie Lannister, how many of y'all watch Game of Thrones? Some of y'all do. Okay. But yeah, so the thing is, if we think about it, that Jamie Lannister is introduced as a character that most people are going to see that he is evil. Defenestration for love. That's right. So is defenestration all always evil, but it's like, no, I mean, it was done out of love in this case. And so when you take a look at that, um, then you're thinking in terms of that. And then when you see it, as you go on in the series, you can see here where sometimes like the line between good and evil is not uh, necessarily always, uh, you know, I mean, the thing is that, you know, there are people, uh, you know, who may do things that are interpreted. So here's the thing about existentialism. Is the action evil or is it interpreted as evil? Um, so that's something that we can think about as well is, and we might talk about Sartre in another time if we end up spending more than three weeks outside of school, but Jean-Paul Sartre, okay? Uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, who was, uh, you know, who's basically a 20th century uh, existentialist philosopher post-World War II. And what he wrote, he wrote a book called Existentialism is a humanism, okay? And of course, he advocated for the rejection of any set ethics, okay? So you think about this now, this is a quote from him is, hell is other people. I have a YouTube video on this, okay? So YouTube video available, okay? So, you know, the thing about morality, okay, that an existentialism is a humanism that every human being, okay, being has to, has to construct their own ethical system, okay, ethical system that they, you know, for which, okay, for which they owe no one an explanation outside other that, you know, other than themselves, no one else an explanation, 
Okay. Uh, so when you think about that, that basically I am, and this is getting into kind of like, you know, a continuation of a tabula rasa theory or something like that. So for example, Jean-Paul Sartre after World War II is delivering this lecture, existential as a, existentialism as humanism. And what he's trying to do here, his purpose, okay, if we're looking at Jean-Paul Sartre's purpose, that his purpose is to his purpose is to reject this idea that people are saying that existentialism, that's a hopeless philosophy, that it's just nihilistic and hopeless. And Jean-Paul Sartre is saying, actually, it's not that hopeless. So, for example, he said that um, there was a student of his, OK, and I don't know if this is hypothetical or if this really happened, but there was a student of his during the war, during the Nazi occupation of France. The student said, what should I do in this kind of situation? Um, my grandmother needs me to take care of her. But in order to take care of her and to make sure that she is uh, OK, I'd have to collaborate with the Nazis. Like I've got a choice between collaborating the Nazis and, with the Nazis and taking care of my grandmother. And then I've got a choice between joining the French resistance. OK, and so let's think about this. Let's push a poll out here. OK, I'm going to create a poll here. Uh, you know, if you had the choice, OK, between taking care of your grandmother and collaborating with the Nazis, and nobody's gonna see your answers here, okay? The Nazis um, and fighting, joining the French resistance, okay? The French resistance and leaving your grandmother to an uncertain fate, which would you do okay so we're going to say here take care of your grandmother or join the resistance okay so let's see what y'all say here okay this is a moral dilemma here so let's see what y'all have to say here okay interesting okay we see a bit wow okay are y'all able to see the poll or y'all no you have to pick one you have to pick one OK, Tom is a Nazi. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Uh, so. Uh, what if now this is this is the thing that when you when you think about this, you also have to consider that what if somebody could give you a cure? Like, let's think about this. Someone can give you a cure for the coronavirus, a cure for you and your family. OK, so, you know, let's let's check on this. You know, so someone offers you a cure for the coronavirus, okay, enough for 10 people, okay, enough for 10 people of your choosing, okay, and this is kind of like, what is it, the cat in the box experiment or something like that, I forget what that's in there, but if, you know, but if you take the cure and, you know, you take the cure, 10 random people are going to die, okay? Take the cure or refuse the cure, okay? So when we think about this, this is an exploration of ethics, okay? So let's think about this, that someone offers you this cure, okay? Now, this is very interesting. What I'm seeing here is 43% of you say that you take care of your grandmother, and then 62% are saying that you would join the resistance, okay? Now, we see here that there is a very fine line here, okay? Now, very interesting. OK, now this one is much different here that y'all don't like this idea of being able to choose 10 people who are guaranteed to survive. OK, that is very interesting. Only 21 percent of you are saying that you would take the cure and you would make sure that the 10 most important people to you in the world survive while 10 other random people are going to die oh enough yeah 10 people of your choosing you get to you get to choose sorry grandma okay so as far as that uh as far as that goes you're not okay so here's the thing you know which like i said yesterday don't do it anakin i have the high ground you know so so with this let's think about this now now we're at uh, 32 we've got about a third of you who would take the cure okay so let's think about it 
if we look at it from a perspective of traditional morality, we can either look at it in the terms of this would be right and this would be wrong, or we can think about the greatest good for the greatest number. But then again, you know, that's one of those things from a utilitarian standpoint. Now, when we think about this, okay, when we think about this, it's a little, it's showing to be a little bit higher of two than 2%. You underestimate my power to cure the coronavirus, right? So as far as that goes, what we want to think about is those 30 of you who said, the 30% who said that I would take the cure, 10 random people can die because the people I care about are going to survive and I can guarantee their survival. Now, the 70% of you or 69.6% .6 or however many, you could say like you are a terrible person and a complete piece of expletive, but that is where hell is other people. Now, I would say, I would say of those of you, of those of you who refuse the cure, let's think about this, okay? Of those of you, who refused the cure, okay, for you and the 10 people you care about most, okay? You, no, yeah, you can't do that. It's a moral exercise, okay? Oh, you know what? That's You could take it and cure nine people and then put the rest of it in the lab. So for you and the 10 people you care about most, what would you say motivated your decision the most, okay? And I would say here your own conscience fear of being judged by society let's think about this and this is only for those of you who refuse the cure for you and 10 people you care about okay so as far as that goes was this your own conscience or are you afraid of being judged like that people would think that you are a terrible person okay maybe y'all are just uh you know do you know y'all y'all are just inherently good people right but here's the thing well then again i was just not now this is where existentialism comes in because what we think about in terms of like traditional christian morality is the morality of sacrifice that it would be better to refuse the cure for myself and people that i care about and guarantee that yeah see here's the thing like angel i'm with you i think that like these two people who have admitted that like i said that i'd refuse it because i'm fearing being judged i, I i'm with you i think that these two people are the most honest people in this room that's the way i see it imagine being a good person um and so as far as that uh as that go yeah they're being judged right now and they're willing to admit that the reason they refuse the cure is because they don't want to be socially ostracized so here's yeah and here's the thing that sartre says okay now when we talked about collaborating with the nazis to take care of your grandfather now are there our grandmother are there going to be people who are going to say you are a terrible person because you did that and you know the thing is that john paul sartre says Nobody can make that decision except for you. Nobody is accountable for that decision except for you, okay? And don't let anybody judge you for what you say. So in no exit, this is, you know, when he wrote, hell is other people. Let me explain to you why, what he meant by that, okay? He wrote this in a play called No Exit. And so basically, this guy died and he went to hell. And when he went to hell, He's actually not in a fire. He's checked into like this uh, hotel and he has to share a room with these two women and they can never sleep. OK, they can never sleep. Uh, they can never close their eyes. They basically have to spend their time. Now, for those of you who are introverts, you can really understand this. OK, for those of you who are introverts, uh, you know, you can understand that like, yeah, like as an introvert, I need to be alone to recharge. I don't need people always looking at me. Think about why the phones, you know, increase our anxiety and make us more depressed. Hell is other people. That this main character was a pacifist and he was a draft dodger. Like he, he dodged the draft in the war and people judged him. These women that were with him, they were like, you're a coward. You didn't, you know, he said, I didn't enlist because of my principles. And this woman looked at him and said, you didn't enlist because you're a coward. And, you know, the thing is that the point being hell is other people because other people make us doubt our more our decisions that if we can get to the point where we say that this was my decision, I made it and there is no 
absolute morality other than the morality that I construct, then that's something that is, uh, you know, then that's something that's in line with existentialism because morality is subjective, not objective. Okay. So objective means that it exists outside of, uh, you know, it, so objective means that it exists outside of myself, that it is right or it is wrong, that we could say, taking care of your grandmother or join the resistance, there is a right or a wrong choice. But what we have to do, according to Sark, you make your own decisions. Like each in life, each man draws a portrait of himself, apart from which there is nothing. OK, and that's basically the point that Sartre is trying to make. So understand when you see existentialism and that's something that comes up in your course and exam description. OK, so when you think about existentialism, let's see, AP Euro CED 2019. Um, so when we look at the AP European, well, wait, what? What? OK, yeah, I think that's uh, where we are here. All right. The course and exam description. Okay, so existentialism. So we want to notice here that this is 914, 20th and 21st century culture, arts, and demographic trends. And one of those is understanding what is existentialism. Okay, so you want to know what that is. So we've gotten you that. Now, we could also go into like Freudian psychology becomes more popular. Now, I think that we will just kind of leave it at that for today. Uh, but you know, going into, uh, you know, going into that, uh, let me go ahead and see if we've just got any other like random kind of questions here. Hopefully you understand, uh, you know, hopefully you understand uh, that. All right. So as far as that, uh, as that goes, that is, uh, that is, that is pretty, uh, y'all want to ask me personal questions. That's, uh, that's very, uh, very interesting. Okay. Uh, yeah. So as far as uh, as far as that goes, like I've never met John Green. I don't know John Green. Uh, people want to know, do I have beef with John Green from Crash Course? OK, um, if I ever make like a snide remark about Crash Course, uh, that's something that, you know, I'm just uh, I'm just playing around on Twitter. I'm doing uh, doing business, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Now, of course, you know, I'm a lot you know different than John Green. It's like I make, you know, I. I I write the content of my videos myself. You know, I, uh, you know, am in charge of making my videos. Somebody doesn't write for me, that sort of thing. But as far as like having beef, uh, you know, no, I mean, some people like to learn from him. Some people like to learn from me. But that is a really funny thing. I don't know if John Green even knows that I exist. Uh, so with that, you know, it's kind of hard to know if somebody has beef with you. Savage, am I firing shots? I'm just like saying things. OK, what are y'all? Y'all are so funny, um, you know, but but anyway, yeah, I don't I don't know uh, if he even knows that I exist. So, yeah, I'm not trying to roast John Green, but that's kind of funny, uh, you know, for the right charity, I might. I might agree to a boxing match. Would that be kind of fun? All right. So uh, so with that, now, Tom Green, uh, did any of y'all watch the Tom Green show back when that was on? Speaking of absurdism, okay. So intellectual developments uh, reflect the general, okay. So here's the thing, Tyler, I think I've already kind of, you know, I think I've already kind of responded to this, right? So when we think about intellectual developments of the 20th century, that would be answered basically going into my explanation of the age of enlightenment, okay? When you think about World War I as kind of a period on the age of enlightenment. Now, of course, rational enlightened thinking isn't like dead or gone or anything like that. Uh, now, this is, uh, but yeah, basically I'd look at what I put on the Google document. Now, we Spain is part of Europe, okay? So yes, yeah, Spain is part of Europe. Shivan, uh, that is correct, okay? Uh, hopefully I got your name right, it's a written test, correct? So, so with that, Spain is part of Europe, but yeah, you're right that we really don't hear a lot about Spain after the age of exploration. Uh, that is something that, you know, is definitely the case that we don't necessarily hear a lot, uh, you know, a lot about uh, a lot about Spain. Um, and, and you do, you wouldn't hurt yourself learning a bit about the Spanish Civil War and Franco's dictatorship, but it's definitely not going to be as emphasized as, uh, you know, when we think about Nazi Germany, the Soviet Union. Let me see if the word Spanish 
Civil War. Um, that actually does. Okay, so you actually do want to know a bit about Franco. I've actually got a video about Franco where I sat down with a professor of modern Spanish history. If you put in Francisco Franco, Tom Ritchie, um, that would be something if you really want to learn about Franco's dictatorships. I think the video is titled was Franco a fascist? Because a lot of times people say that Franco was a fascist, but the majority opinion among scholars is that Franco was not a fascist per se, because a fascist cooperates uh, with the church, you know, with religious authorities as a pragmatic measure. So for example, we are not necessarily going to see like, you know, Hitler, nobody's going to argue that like Hitler was a committed Christian or something like that. Now, Hitler and Mussolini did strike concordance with the Catholic Church, but that was based on pragmatic measures, whereas Franco was a sincere Catholic who wanted to bolster the power of the church and was afraid. Like I've mentioned that a lot of these modern art and politi you know, political movements um, had left wing, uh, you know, left wing sympathies. And Franco saw that, you know, and, and a lot of, you know, conservative people in Spain saw a threat coming from these, uh, you know, from these left wing, uh, you know, folks that were looking for um, a republic in Spain, uh, you know, a left wing republic that was going to uh, really, you know, take the church out of Spanish life. So with that, I would look up Francisco Franco on YouTube or Francisco Franco, Tom Ritchie. Okay. Um, can we discuss the topic of Herzl and his creation of Zionism? Okay. Now, as far as that goes, what I'm going to direct y'all to, if you go to marcolearning.com, okay. So marcolearning dot com and then you would go to free dash events or you can just go to marcolearning.com and go to you know click the button that says free events okay so what i'm going to do here last week i did a multiple choice uh clinic on marco learning that's going to be available for a few more weeks okay so i did a multiple choice clinic at marco learning so let's go ahead and uh you know marcolearning.com OK, and what you can do here, it's going to load. It's going to take a second. They've been getting a lot of traffic this this week. I'm going to go to free events and I'm going to have to scroll down. OK, they need to work on their landing page here, but uh, I'm going to have to scroll down to free student events. OK, so these are teacher things first and then uh, for students. AP Euro multiple choice strategy session, okay? So I'm gonna post a direct link to this, and this actually has me going over a multiple choice set that I wrote myself on Zionism, okay? So this, I'm gonna go ahead and give you, that is a direct link to the AP Euro multiple choice session that we did this week. Yeah, I don't say, now I wouldn't, I think that watching the teacher events would be kind of counterproductive. I think, I mean, it's nothing stopping you from, nothing stopping you from watching this, uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, we are, you know, I, I think the student events are going to be much more useful. So we're asking about Zionism. Uh, go ahead and watch that because I do talk about Zionism and something that we've aired very recently. And also we've got uh, the multiple choice set about uh, Zionism, which I think is uh, going to be helpful uh, to y'all. Now with that, let me see what I'm able to do. Am I, I'm not able to attach a file here, but you know what? I can actually link something from my box. Okay. So let me go ahead and link something from my box real quick. Um, and because I know y'all might want the multiple choice set. So let me go ahead and give you the multiple choice set on Zionism. I'm going to go ahead and link that for y'all. I don't have it on my website uh, quite yet, but that'll be there soon. So let me go ahead and just get a direct link for the Zionism. Okay, Zionism, Herzl, st stimulus-based multiple choice question. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and put that there. And... You know, what we want to note here about Zionism that I think is important is a few observations that we want to note that in the 19th century, we see the, at least in Western Europe, like laws that discriminated against Jews legally are, you know, are being uh, gotten rid of. So, for example, y'all might remember the Test Acts um, from the period, you know, between the English Civil, Civil War and the Glorious Revolution. 
Um, that's oh, it, what's blocked? The page or what? Just hit a lick with the box. Okay. So as far as that goes, that should work for y'all, and I'll I'll make a note to put that on my website. Um, so oh my goodness. Uh, yeah. Okay. So that that uh, Justin Timberlake uh, song. Are we thinking about that? All right. So so as far as uh, as far as that y'all are so funny. All right. So going from there, Zionism, we want to notice, note that in Western Europe, legal restrictions against Jews. For, so, for example, the Test Acts were repealed by Parliament in the 1820s, okay? And so Jews could run for office. They could be military officers, any of this stuff. So the Dreyfus Affair represents kind of a turning point in the way that Jews in Europe were seeing themselves, okay? Uh, so as far as that goes, gosh... Uh, Okay, Justin Timberlake got a lot of people laughing. But, you know, with Alfred Dreyfus, he went to the elite French military academy, got a commission in the French army. And then he is, uh, you know, then he is in a situation where somebody gave some secrets to the Germans. Well, Jew, okay, he's Jewish. He must have done it. And so he has tried. He's exiled to the Caribbean. And then when evidence comes up that he didn't really do it, he's retried. And the jury finds him guilty again, okay, even though there was evidence that he didn't do it. And this is really the backdrop for Theodore Herzl and the philosophy of Zionism. Now, what you want to note today is that at the turn of the 20th century, 90% of Jews lived in Europe, and about 90% of Jews lived in Europe. And in, in the 21st century, only about 10% of Jews live in Europe. The, not, the other 90% are divided between the United States and Israel. And so that's something that, you know, really goes back to this realization among European Jews that, Although legal restrictions have been taken away, we are still discriminated against socially. Okay, so as far as uh, as far as that uh, as that goes, uh, the whole squad is always laughing when I stream. All right, so uh, so as far as that goes, somebody let's see if you're uh, you know going as far as that. What is what is this? Okay, Hayden's question. I have no idea what that even means. Okay, so with that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap this up because I've got an A push session. I'm going to be back on Friday. Okay, we're doing Monday, Wednesday, Friday at noon, and we are going to be. Uh, oh gosh, Anaconda. Okay, um, that is uh, okay. So yeah, so let's play Richie guess the song. On that note, I think it's probably about time for us to uh for us to call it uh, a day uh you know i think there's just something about that 85 minute mark where you just kind of had enough of the learning right uh, now uh these are going to be posted on my youtube channel they're also available here on crowdcast and then i'll be back on friday and on friday we're going to focus on to on totalitarianism but we can take some other questions as well all right so with that we the thing is i'm going to be here okay i'm going to be here and also those of you who followed me on Instagram, I'm going to be doing some Instagram lives. I'll be doing some YouTube lives. So just note that as well. OK, make sure you're following Marco Learning um, on. Make sure you're following Marco Learning um, with, uh, you know, at Marco Learning, because I'm going to be doing some things with them as well. Um, and they are actually they're going to have great information about the College Board announcement on Friday. Thank you so much, Hannah, for the kind words about the stream. Um, Sophia, thanks for the recent like. Um, COVID, all right. Uh, thank you for the uh, like in the comment. And we've got uh, Ashley Kristen and R. Lockmer, Ash Aguilar. All right. We've got uh, some folks here supporting me there. And I sure appreciate it. All right. So y'all have a wonderful day and I'll see y'all again on Friday. Miss Francis class, AG. Oh my Lord. Okay. I'm so glad AG is here and uh, make sure to tell Miss Francis hello for me. Okay. She's one of my favorites. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, thanks again for, uh, for being here and I will be back on Friday at noon. Remember, follow me on, on Instagram and Twitter. Follow at Marco Learning because I'm going to be doing some things with them. The Corona class is only one of many things happening over the next several weeks. It's always a pleasure.